We've been having quite a few earth tremors lately. Whoa, there's another one. I better get away from this cliff face in case there are any rock falls. I hope the plane's all right. With these earth tremors and the volcanoes smoking more each week, I think the time I can safely stay here is running out. Maybe some thinking will calm me down. How can I help? Stella, we've been wondering, how come we can be surprised? Yeah, and why do we jump if someone pops a balloon behind us? Right, but when I saw it being popped, I didn't jump. And why do we turn towards what surprised us? And why do our eyes grow big? And what about cold shivers down our spine? What's that all about? Life's full of surprises, isn't it? I've got to think about this one. I'll get back to you. What we're going to have to do for this one is to make sense of senses. Now, it's important for all organisms, plants, animals and us, to be aware of our surroundings and be able to respond to any changes in it. And it all comes down to survival. Now, this can be as simple as noting a drop in temperature and knowing when it's the right time to put on extra clothes or as important as sensing danger, like me a few minutes ago. As I lifted the hot kettle, I saw the lightning flash and heard the loud thunder, which made me jump with painful consequences. Ow! Now, I hope Howie's sensors are working well, because I think he's going to need them in this investigation. I've been told to meet Dr. Kerry Kilburn. He wants my help in an experiment that'll investigate how my senses work. I hope this is the right place. Dr. Kilburn. Howie, come in. Nice place you've got here. Look, when do I start helping you with this experiment? Oh, you already have. Look. I've been watching your responses to different stimuli we showed you in the house. And now we'll look and see what your brain is doing to those same things. How? Well, we'll use this. We put this on your head, and we can measure your brain waves. Mm. Could you hold this right here? Right. This special cap has 128 pads, which will detect electrical activity in my brain. There, how's that? Um, what happens now? Now I plug this into the computer so we can see what your brain waves are doing. Right. I'm going to repeat the stimuli that we showed you in the house, and then we'll see on this screen what happens in your brain. Ready? Open. Huh. The pads pick up my brain's electrical activity and store it in the computer. If I hit play, there. Whoa. White indicates the greatest electrical activity. 
It starts at the back, where sight is processed. It then spreads out as the brain tries to understand what it's seeing. When it does, it sends messages to my body to react. So after the initial stimulus here, all the rest of the brain kicks in to decide what to do about it. That's right. So how long does it take to go from the visual centres recording the image and my whole brain deciding what to do about it? It takes about a third of a second. Phew. And that's exactly what was happening in the haunted house. Yes, that's right. Look, you saw the candles and shadows, your brain worked out that this is probably dangerous, and it told your body to get you out of there. <sighs> now let's look at touch. Reach forward with your right hand. Oh, slime! <sighs> now, let's see what happens. We're looking here at the left side of your brain. The left side of the brain is where touch is first registered. Again, the brain has to think about what it's touching to work out whether a reaction is needed. And then the action moves very quickly to other parts of the brain. I see. So really, it was just like the cobwebs I ran into in the house. That's right. Look. You felt the cobwebs. You remembered you were in a scary place, and you reacted. That's brilliant. Well, I guess that's it. I really feel I know it all now. I'd better be off. Not so fast. There's one more sense to test. <laughs> so, an organism senses what's going on around it and responds to it. And for animals, and for us, this response is usually a movement, either by part of the body or the whole body. But whatever the movement is, it's caused by the muscles. Looking inside a running knee joint, the muscles that cause movement are attached to bones. They're called skeletal muscles. So it's skeletal muscles that move your body, and they work in pairs. Now, you can feel two of these working together when you bend and straighten your arm. You can see it with this model. To bend your arm, the biceps contracts. It gets shorter. You can see it bulge and harden. The triceps relaxes. As a result, the biceps pulls the bones together and the arm bends. To straighten your arm, the opposite happens. The triceps contracts and the biceps relaxes. This pulls the bones straight. Muscles can only contract and pull bones, never push them. So, using muscles to pick something up or walk is something we control, and that's why they're called voluntary muscles. We choose to use them. But not always, as Howie's about to find out. Howie! 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 Mm, morning, Mum. Have you got my tea? No. It's time for our investigation into muscle responses. Oh! All right, come on, then. Now, there are two kinds of muscle responses. There's voluntary, like this, when I move my arm myself, and then there's the automatic, like that. Oh! OK, now, we'll get started. Turn over. Martin McDonough knows all about muscle response. He's putting a sensitive pad on my leg to measure how fast my muscles respond. Right, the first thing we're going to do is to find out the difference between these two responses. And we're going to set up a competition between you and your body's automatic reflexes to see which reacts the fastest. So it's a competition between me and my own body. First thing we're going to do is look at your body's automatic reflex reaction. Right, this hammer here... The hammer will make my foot move up. And cause the foot to move up. This will stretch which will stretch my calf muscle. Which will set off a reflex reaction. This will cause my body to have an which automatic reflex, which will make my foot, foot down. move down. It's what happens when you jump and land on your feet. Yeah. 
As the hammer makes my calf stretch, a sensor in my muscle sends out two messages. One goes to the reflex movement center in my spine. This sends a message back, telling the muscle to contract. That's the automatic response. The other message goes to my brain, to tell it the muscle's being touched. But I'm choosing to ignore that for now. Let's have a look at the results. OK, this is where the hammer struck your foot, and this is your muscle's reflex response here. The graph shows that the automatic response took 40 thousandths of a second, 40 milliseconds. How fast is the impulse going? Well, over 100 miles an hour. Crumbs, and I've got to beat that. I'd better give it a go. This time, when you feel the hammer, I want you to push your foot down as quickly as possible. Ready? Push. So what's going on now? Well, the same messages were sent as before. One to the movement center, which caused another automatic response. But this time, when my brain received a message, I wanted it to move a muscle. So my brain sent a message back to the movement center, which caused a voluntary response as well. And the result? Well, there's the automatic reflex after 40 milliseconds, but my voluntary response is 140 milliseconds. Why so long? I mean, surely the messages travelled along my nerves at the same speed. Yes, but it's got further to go. It's got to go all the way up to the brain, and then we have to add on time for decision-making. So now I know that reflex actions are faster than those that I have to think about. That's right. So I guess my next investigation is to find out why we have both voluntary and involuntary reactions. Exactly. And to do that, you need to see Audrey in the next lab. You mean no more lying around? Hey, but I might have time to grab a cup of tea this time. Well, here's Audrey. What's she up to? Hiya. So, Audrey, how do you test for an unexpected stimulus response? Well, what I'd like you to do is jump from this platform down onto this blue surface. And while you do that, I'll measure your muscle activity. Yeah, but that's hardly unexpected, is it? I can see it. And because I can see it, I can prepare my muscles for landing. Ah, but there's a surprise element. Mm. What Harry doesn't know is that this blue surface is really a false floor, and the real floor is 25 centimetres below. What was that? Nothing. Off you go. Ah! You tricked me. Yes, but all for good cause. Let's see what happened. This muscle activity here is where you took off from the platform. And this muscle activity, as you can see, is building up in preparation for landing. Now, that's controlled by the brain. But, of course, you didn't land. You fell through the false platform here. And so what happened is the muscle activity switches off until you do touch down when you get this very big reflex coming to save you. So reflexes are there for those emergencies that need an instant response. There just isn't time to wait for the brain to come online. That's right. Cup of tea. Oh, great. We know what we can do, but what about plants? They can't run away or talk or see or smell. Or can they? This is a radish. It doesn't seem to be able to do or respond to anything. But look at this. How did it do that? This radish has been reacting to the stimulus of light. In growing, it weaved towards that stimulus over four days. Many plants respond like this, but it happens so slowly you don't notice. If plants could do something like that, what else are they capable of? One for Howie, I think. I'm here to meet Dr Jennifer Miller. She's a plant expert, and I'm really going to need her help in this investigation. She's batty about plants, so I thought I'd bring her one. But I can't decide which one she'd like, the red or the white. Do you know, it's funny, but I guess this is what separates us from plants. I mean, we can see, we can choose between different colours, and we can talk. Plants can talk as well, you know. Plants are a lot more like us than you'd think. They can do all sorts of things. Come on, I'll show you. Hey, this is going to be good. 
Welcome to Star Plants. And today on Star Plants, meet the seedlings that can choose a colour. The plant that can get a bit touchy. The plant that can count. And introducing the plant that can talk into this microphone, all on Star Plants. Oh, look. What's this? Now, this plant's the Mosapudica. It's one of the most sensitive. Try touching one of its leaflets. What's happening here? Well, not only does the leaf respond to even the tiniest touch, but it's made up of leaflets which are all connected by something a bit like our nervous system. And as one is touched, it sends a message to all the others to move too. Fantastic. Let's hear it for the Mimosa Pudica. So, Jennifer, what's going on here? Well, remember you said that plants couldn't choose colour? Mm -hmm. Well, I've got a little experiment here to show you. There are seedlings inside this box that have been growing in the dark, but if we switch on these two lights, we can see them on the television. Red light is shining from the left and blue from the right. The small camera connected to the television shows that the seedlings are growing straight at the moment. Well, what's going to happen? Oh, wait and see. We'll come back in a while. Time to visit the Venus flytrap. Right, what's this one going to do? Well, you'll have to look at it really closely. Inside these special leaves, there are three hairs on each side. Can you see them? Yeah. Try touching one with your probe. These are the special hairs that are the trigger for the plant to close in an insect. Try it. Well, nothing's happened. What, is it full? Try again. Whoa, bye-bye bug. What the plant is doing is remembering how many times it's been touched. It can remember the first touch for up to a minute. That's incredible. I guess that's so it can tell the difference between a breath of wind, a drop of water and proper dinner. Exactly. The Venus flytrap. So Next, a plant that can talk? Jennifer, you're recording a plant. What can that possibly tell you? It can tell you quite a lot, actually. It can tell you if it needs a drink. There are tubes inside the plant's stalk that break when they get dry, and we can pick them up on this ultra-sensitive microphone. Listen. Don't worry. It's fine as soon as it's watered. Now, what about those seedlings? Which colour did they choose? It's blue. That's right. The seedlings will go towards blue light, but not red. That's because they've got special sensors, a bit like our eyes. Star plants. I thank you. So, living things respond to the environment in lots of different ways. Now, here's one for you. Can you think of a muscle in the body that you have no control over ever? I'll give you a clue. You use it more when you're exercising. It can't be the muscles in your arms and legs. You can easily control them. Hang on. When you exercise, you get out of breath. So could it be the muscles which make the lungs work? You can still control them by breathing deeply. Well, that's enough. I give up. Yeah, my heart's thumping. Oh, and mine. 